Someday soon, my Savior will call out my Hello everyone, I'm glad you're here tonight and I hope you're ready for a Bible class. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. And once again, if you don't have a Bible in front of you, jot down the scripture references and make sure that you look them up and see that I'm reading them correctly and so forth. Last week we talked about one of the first messages ever printed down that the Apostle Paul spoke, and that was in Acts chapter 13. And we talked about the surety of the gospel, that we have forgiveness of sins through the gospel. And so tonight I want to continue that thought, but in a slightly different manner. Notice, if you will, in Acts chapter 17, uh, he has gone into Thessalonica, and as you know, he wrote two small books to the Thessalonians, and they have great and precious promises in them. One is what we commonly call the rapture today. It's how the Lord descend, himself descends from heaven with a shout and calls the dead in Christ, and we which are alive remain up to be with him. And then in 2 Thessalonians, it promises us that we're not going to go through the wrath of God. Uh, 1 Thessalonians does that same thing also, but both of them do. And that we were called unto this salvation by a simple and precious gospel of Christ, the power of God unto salvation. All right, now, in Acts chapter 17, the first few verses is where he went and first taught this to the Thessalonians. There's a strange sort of teaching that says that Paul didn't teach the gospel of Christ to the Thessalonians, and that's only because they can't find it in the book, uh, book of Acts. As I mentioned last week, if you went from chapter 2 all the way through the book of Acts, you would find things to scratch your head about when it comes to finding the doctrine you are to believe. On the other hand, 20 times... You may, if you didn't see this, one of the first programs we had, we went through the 20 times that the Bible tells us that Paul's the apostle of the Gentiles, and we went through about seven or eight times, maybe nine, of the times when Paul referred to the church he was preaching to as the church, the body of Christ, and never did he refer to preaching to the kingdom church that Peter, James, and John preached to, which probably next week we'll go back to, to making those kinds of comparisons. But tonight I want to give you a reason to know your Bible. Okay? A reason to know it and some things that will help you to find out how to know it. Notice it says that in verse 13, Thessalonica is, Thessalonica is where he has been here. Um, and he leaves. Go, go down to verse 10. I'm sorry, verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. You see, everywhere he's going, if there's a synagogue, he's going there. Verse 11. These, the people of Berea, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that, and here's why they were more noble. Noble, by the way, has to do with doing the thing which is right. Practicing a lifestyle of doing the thing which is right. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and here's how. In that, they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now let me tell you something about that. The first time I ever saw that verse was the first time I ever heard uh, a man named E.C. Moore preach. And Brother E.C. Moore at the time was 49 years old, and he drove 250 miles to teach a Bible class to a bunch of people who didn't know any Bible. And he taught us what it was like to be a Berean. And primarily it's along these lines. You look at the scripture. Listen to the word. Get your mind open, ready to hear it. But don't trust the preacher. Search the scripture daily so that the scripture teaches you whether or not what you heard the preacher say was correct. And Brother Moore used that as a basis for teaching us. And I, I loved Brother Moore, and I will love him eternally, and on and on. But he was not my guru. He kept turning me back to this book to learn what the Bible said, not to learn what old E.C. said. One time we told him that another preacher sounded a lot like him when he preached and it made him very angry. He said, he got up and preached a sermon after that and he said, don't, don't follow me, I'll let you down. I was so glad to have heard that 
early on, you know, so to speak. I hadn't heard very many messages when I heard that one. Don't follow a man, not even Brother Moore. <laughs> and I admired him for that. I really did. He was he stuck to that. He would not let people just simply. But if if he told me something, we used to ride in the car a lot together. He and I. And I'd be sitting on the passenger side and he'd be driving and he'd say, uh, do you know what so-and-so says? And I'd say, yeah, I think so. He'd say, what's it say? He knew. And so he'd check me. If I didn't get it exactly right, he'd say, open the Bible up and read it. Because he's going to make a point to me about what the scripture said. I loved that about him too. I would implore you to be that way. Do not take my word for any of this that you hear me preach. But rather be like a Berean. Listen to it. Have your mind ready to receive it. But check it out by the Scripture. You read the Scripture. That's why every week I tell you, get if you don't have a Bible open, you get a pad and paper uh, or a pad and pencil and you write down these Scripture references. And you read them for yourself. This is not difficult. King James Bible is written in 6th grade English. Even in today's dumbed down societal uh, evolution uh, education. Nevertheless, it's sixth grade English. You can understand it. My father had a third grade education. My mother had a sixth grade education. They could read the Bible. There weren't any hard words in there. If you, gotta, if you think they're hard words to read, why don't you get you a self-pronouncing Bible? That'll take care of it. Anyway. Berea. Be a Berean. You don't have to have a name tag on your church called Berean to be a Berean. Be a Berean because you want to be like these people. The noblest thing you could do is to take the Word of God as it says it, where it says it, to whom it says it, and never change a word in it. So there's these Bereans. Now, when it comes down to simple study, that is what you do. You go in, you pick up your Bible, and you sit down, and you begin to read. I'm going to show you just a couple of clues, if you will. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We've used this verse before on this program, but we're going to use it again here. And we won't wear it out. This verse, this verse can't get worn out. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Paul writes to Timothy, whom he's leaving with all of this magnificent doctrine for us, the church, the body of Christ. And in verse 15 he said, Study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, there's two things I want you to know. One is that if you are told that you should be rightly dividing the word of truth as you study, and that's what he just got through telling you there. If you're told to do that, then for sure you could wrongly divide the word of truth. How are you going to know the difference? All right, let's take a look at a couple of other verses. Notice, if you will, in verse 7, same chapter, Paul says to Timothy, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Here's the deal. What Paul said to Timothy is the books in your Bible of Romans to Philemon. There are 13 of them. 85 or 90 pages, depending on the size of the type you've got. And Paul wrote them all. It's about half the books in the New Testament. Some of them are smaller than uh, some of the other books in the New Testament, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Revelation. But some of them are bigger than the other books in the Bible, like Hebrews, and First and Second Peter, and John, and First John, and so forth. Now, what I'm trying to get you to understand is, Romans of Philemon, folks, is written by the man God chose to make him to be your apostle. An apostle, the word means this, is a man who receives a message from the Lord. And he goes and he tells the message. And he tells the message. And he tells the message. And he doesn't stop until he's stopped. But he's the one that got, the apostle is the one that got the message. The twelve fit that mode. And there's no reason to think they ever stopped preaching what the Lord gave them to preach. And Paul got this message. And there is no reason to believe he stopped until Caesar cut his head off. And in the last book that he wrote, this is it, last book that he wrote, 
He said these two things very clearly. Consider what I say and the Lord give the understanding in all things. And then he told a young man here, Timothy had been traveling with him from Acts chapter 16 on, some probably 25 years. And he's writing back to Timothy here. Timothy's been with him all of the time that Paul wrote in, in Acts chapter 16, about verse 5, uh, 5 to say 8, long in there, Paul wrote the book of Galatians. That's the first book Paul wrote. Timothy got with him in Acts 16, verse 1, 2, and 3. Timothy was with him all the time or in and out from him all of the time that all 13 books were written. And he tells Timothy, who was with him the whole time, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Do you understand what I'm talking about? He told him to study. He didn't tell him to sit back on his laurels now that you've graduated from seminary and pick up an outline book over at the bookstore and that'll give you 50 sermons a year and that's enough sermons for anybody to preach in a year. Blah, 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 blah. No, he told him, consider what I say and the Lord give the understanding in all things. And he said, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Notice, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 1. A friend of mine asked a denominational preacher one day, why don't you preach more grace? He says, well, I, I just don't have time. And he says, well, what prevents you from having time? And he says, well, we only, we only have, we get about 36 sermons sent down from above here on the hierarchy and the uh, I only got that only leads, and I take vacation, and I get three weeks. That only leaves me about thirteen or fourteen sermons that I can study out on my own. Well, I don't know what my friend told him. I don't know what I'd have told him. Quit this stupid church. Who put them in charge of your ministry? Hierarchy's not in the Bible. There's no hierarchy. There, are people sit on thrones. There are people drive around in with uh, limousines with uh, drivers. Uh, they're in the back seat sitting there as though they've got corn for sale or whatever you want to say about them. And they don't ever preach a sermon. They call doctor this and DD this and whatever. And they don't ever preach a sermon. They never tell anybody the gospel of Christ. A friend of mine was went to a, got saved at a fairly old age. His youngest son was still playing football when he got saved. He's about 55, 56 years old, years ago. And he went to a football game, I believe, down in Monroeville in Alabama. And he's standing in line at a, at a dairy delight kind of place waiting to get an order. And uh, he tapped the shoulder of the uh, man in front of him, big, tall, skinny man. He said, say, I want to ask you something. The man turned around and said, yes, what is it? He said, are you saved? And the man said, I'll have you know I'm the associational missionary for Blah Blah Church. And my friend looked up at him, put his hands on his side and says, well, you sorry, rascal, why didn't you ask me? Good question. Think about the principle there. This man's some hot shot, getting paid a monthly salary. Doesn't do any preaching except to go chew out some church somewhere where they're not giving enough money to missions. Instead, a guy who just got saved, hadn't been saved but just a few days, tapped him on the shoulder and asked him if he was saved. By the way, my friend said he never did answer me. That's the way the silly world has gotten, the, the religious world. It's all like that, folks. It's all like that. Organized, plumb out of doing anything for the Lord. Plumb out of it. Nothing being done for the Lord. Only being done to propagate their system. And if you think I'm picking on churches, I am. I was in one of those sorry things after I got saved for nine years. I know what they do. I served on all their boards except for one. Only. 
All organizations are of mankind. God Almighty didn't start any. He told you to be organized and do things decently and in order, but He didn't tell you to have an organization. He didn't tell you to join an organization. I mean, if you wanted to go join a church, why would you want to go join a church? Did you get saved? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Do you believe Christ died for your sins, was buried, and was raised for your justification? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Don't you belong to Him? If you belong to the Lord, do you think you belong need to belong to a church? No, you don't. I suppose now I get half the preachers in town writing to me about that. It won't make any difference. It won't make any difference whatsoever. You can't find church membership in a Bible. Do you know that? You can't find a hierarchy. You can't find an organization. And you can't find church membership in Bibles. Just like there aren't any altar calls in the Bible. And on and on it goes. Nobody but the twelve apostles ever kept the communion table. Do you know that? Nobody but the twelve apostles. And the only time you'll ever see it in your scripture being done in the name of the Lord with the Lord in mind is when the twelve did it with Jesus Christ before he was crucified. Look here in 2 Timothy chapter 1. You know, watch out, I get to start preaching. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Notice in verse uh, 9. Um, yeah, in verse 9. It's, it's the power of God. God. Verse 9, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Let me back here. Before the world began, there was a purpose. A purpose was drawn up by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The purpose was carried out in the writings of, apostle, of the Apostle Paul. All of the Bible, but to you and me, the writings of the Apostle Paul tells us all about this purpose. Now look. Called us by His grace. Uh, and uh, it was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Verse 10. But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now think about it. Paul, Acts chapter 9, right here. Right here where Paul got saved. Right there. The Lord appeared to him as a, a, as a light brighter than the midday sun. And the Lord appearing to him made manifest something. Look at verse 10. That which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. That appearing was to the Apostle Paul, ladies and gentlemen. You know how I know that? Because of what it showed. Watch. Who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. What is the gospel? How that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised again for our justification. Last week we went over Romans 4, verse 24 and 25. If we believe on Him that raised Jesus Christ from the dead he, because He was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification, then we have the righteousness of God imputed to us. Wow! So what was manifest? The glorious gospel of the blessed God was manifest. Notice He says here, uh, verse 11 about this gospel verse 11 whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles that's why we get it in Romans through Philemon we get it verse 12 for the which cause I also suffer these things nevertheless I'm not ashamed for I know whom I believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day now watch to Timothy 25 or 30 years traveling with him, handling all 13 of these books, many of them he himself, Timothy himself delivered for Paul. He says to Timothy here, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. Look back in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Just a couple pages to your left. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 
What are we doing here? We're trying to find out how to rightly divide the word of truth. That's what we're told to do. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what we want to do. We want to rightly divide the word of truth. Now we just read a verse that said, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. Now notice here, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, referring to a time earlier in his ministry, that thou must charge some, watch, that they teach no other doctrine. Timothy didn't have any other doctrine except Paul's. Timothy was from Derby, Lystra, Derby area. Paul went through there in Acts 14. When he goes back to there in Acts 16, he takes Timothy with him from that time on. 16, chapter 16, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And on and on. And Timothy was with him the rest of the time. Or in and out from him. But with him and with all the word of God that Paul wrote. So he says to Timothy, charge them people who stand up and teach the word Teach no other doctrine. Well, then that would have been Paul's doctrine. Look back in 2 Timothy and look in 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says to Timothy in verse 10, But thou hast known, I'm sorry, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. Paul's doctrine. Look down, if you will, in verse 14. But continue thou, again, to Timothy. He's telling Timothy this. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Wow. Well, I know his mother and his grandmother taught him the Old Testament. Yours probably did too. Mine did. Uh, Not my grandparents, but my, my parents did. I went to church and learned the Old Testament stories. I learned how to look up things in the Old Testament early. But I didn't know Paul's doctrine until 42 years ago. I didn't have the benefit that Timothy had. But the Lord granted me a great privilege of being in the company of people who believed Paul's doctrine. I could see it. And I knew from whence I learned it from this Bible. And have, I have been assured of it from this Bible. Now he says, verse 16. I know there's somebody out there saying, this guy don't even use the whole Bible. Oh, yes, this guy does use the whole Bible. But you look at it as it says it, where it says it, to whom it says it. And don't spiritualize. That'll make you spell, tell spiritual lies. And it'll take away from your spiritual eyes. Don't spiritualize the Bible. Take it literally. There's three applications of Scripture. There's only one interpretation. Only one interpretation. There's three applications. One of them is historical. One of them is literal doctrinally. And the other one is spiritually doctrinally. And all of it is profitable. But don't claim something God gave to someone else and say, that's what I'm going to have. You ain't going to have them streets of gold, no mansions in the corner of glory land, or any such thing as that. They're not there. That's not what you're going to have. You've got a different inheritance Read about it carefully. Paul wrote you all about it. Look at this passage, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And the last thing Paul said to Timothy there about what he should do, he said, preach the word. Well, he's already said, my doctrine... No other doctrine. Uh, re- keep, remember what I say, uh, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. I mean, it's Paul's doctrine. It's Romans to Philemon. Paul called what he preached, uh, when he preached the gospel of Christ, Paul called it his gospel. He said, my gospel, three times. He referred to the doctrine as his doctrine, the doctrine the Lord gave him. Now notice, he said, we read a while ago in 2 Timothy chapter 1 that that it was from the foundation of the world, or from before the foundation of the world, that this was all planned. Amen? We read that, right? Maybe I ought to read it again. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. 
God who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Now watch. Which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now go back to Romans and look in Romans 16. Romans 16. In Romans 16, verse 25. Romans is the is uh, uh, Romans and First Corinthians are the longest two books that Paul wrote. Romans and First Corinthians each have sixteen chapters. The uh, first Romans is filled with doctrine. First Corinthians is filled with a lot of rebuke. So it's not quite as doctrine filled, although it has much doctrine in it. It's not quite as filled with doctrine as Romans is. And when we come to the end of Romans, look at verse twenty five, chapter sixteen, verse twenty five. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest. Folks, there's something back here that was a plan that the, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit put together before the foundation of the world. Nobody knew it until it came over here to the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9 and sometimes after that on a continual basis until it was all written down, given to us by Jesus Christ through God the Father before the world began. Since you're right there in Romans 16, we'll go over on the next page to the right in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And he's talking about coming to them humbly and without any uh, planning of forethought, just dependent upon the Lord. And he says, here's the reason, verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And the power of God is the preaching of the gospel of Christ, ladies and gentlemen. Verse 6, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, and got anything to do with your flesh, Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. God ordained when? Before the world. Just like Second Peter, uh, Second Timothy chapter 1 said, before the world began. God ordained before the world unto our glory, verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Well, they didn't crucify him. Peter never gloried in that. Peter looked at him, pointed a finger at him, and said, you blockheads, you've killed the Lord of glory. Paul said, God forbid that I should glory, save in that cross of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing I can glory in. I'm like Paul. I'm a blasphemer. I had, I had no chance of getting saved if it hadn't been for the gospel of the grace of God, if it hadn't been that Christ died for my sins in spite of the fact that I'm a blasphemer and no good bum. How else would I get saved? How else would you get saved? What would you ever do that would warrant salvation in your life? You say, well, I didn't commit adultery. You want to read all 613 of those laws and see which one you did commit? You say, well, I didn't kill anybody. Read what Jesus said about your heart in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. See whether or not you match up. Nobody matches up. The law just shows us we're condemned. So what have we got? We've got a Savior in Jesus Christ. That's a lot to be thankful for. We've got a Word of God that we are told to rightly divide it as we study. And if we can rightly, we could wrongly, be careful how you read and take to yourself that thing which the Lord has given you. He'd given you great and precious promises in Romans to Philemon. He didn't give you anything that he gave unto the nation of Israel. And he didn't give you anything that he gave to anybody else in this Bible. He gave you what he gave to everyone else in the church, the body of Christ. I hope you're a member of it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for you. He'll save you. Trust him today. I appreciate you being here. I hope it's been a blessing. We'll be back next week, same time. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Someday soon I'll be in heaven.